back to Brian. Thanks, Hector. Okay, so without further ado, it is an absolute honor, privilege to welcome Dr. Vince Hunton back to Miami. Um, he is a Miami native, and so Miami is, uh, is home, or at least one among many homes uh, to Vince. And uh, so Vince serves, uh, as you probably already know, as the historian and curator at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've watched the transformation of that museum over the last several years, and it has been sort of tectonic shifts uh, in terms of what it was and what it is today. Uh, the artifacts are still as rich, um, but the museum itself and the presence and the brand is just overwhelming, and it's a testament to the work that Vince and his team uh, at the Spy Museum in Washington um, you know, sort of ed have endeavored. Um, Vince specializes in uh, late World War II, early Cold War, and so it's uh, no surprise that he's here to talk to us today a little bit about the intersection of Miami, the Cold War, and uh, I would say the U.S., but it's really the global intelligence, uh, you know, operating spaces. And so with that, um, I will plug two of his books, Nuking the Moon and Other Intelligence Schemes and Military Plots Left on the Drawing Board, and The Nuclear Spies, America's Atomic uh, Inter Intelligence Operation Against Hitler and Stalin. Uh, Vince's talk today is going to be the basis of a forthcoming book that uh, he is on record, and by the way, this is being recorded, Vince, and so he is on record that he is going to use the Miami Military Museum as a, uh, as a kickoff to launch the book. Um, <laughs> one of maybe a few, uh, so I won't, I won't yes. pin him into us being the only one, but, but certainly at some point in the tour, he'll come down to Miami uh, and present his findings. And so with that, uh, Dr. Hutton, I, I turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Brian. I, I, I think when you said use the Miami Military Museum, I was like, I'm going to use everything they got at the Miami Military Museum for this. I'm going to use FIU and everything they've got and everyone else down there. I think that, you know, as a native uh, of Miami, I grew up uh, like, you know, many of us did just surrounded by history that we didn't know necessarily. I mean, that's, it's just every street has some kind of history that we may not realize. And then when I went and got my PhD focusing on, Cold War and, you know, late kind of, you know, talking late 40s, 50s, 60s, Cold War period, I would be reading books that had nothing to do with Miami. And somehow Miami found their way into it, right? There was the, the shipment went through Miami or they met down in Miami or, you know, someone was recruited from Miami. I'm not talking just about Bay of Pigs or the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm talking about during the 1980s in Iran Contra and El Salvador and all those other places. During the 1970s where the FBI was spying on its own citizens, a lot of that, the Miami field office was huge as a part of that because of the, the ties that they thought the new left had and the Black Panthers to Fidel Castro. You know, these are things that I just kept thinking, man, there's so much wonderful history here in Miami, but it's huge. It's massive. How can I possibly bring all this together and figure out a way to put this into a book? Well, fortunately, um, I have a friend from when I was a kid who was also a Miami native, uh, and he took a career path somewhat similar to mine, but it, it went off into a different area. There's an intelligence side to it, but there's a Coast Guard side to it, and there's a government side to it. And he also is the son and grandson of uh, Cuban immigrants, actually. And he's here today. Yes. And, and, and he, uh, the, um, the book that was held up uh, by Dr. Atwood was signed by his grandfather. So uh, we're talking me coming from a very intel related perspective coming from a perspective of my father came over in the 1940s and watched this transformation take place and then my co-author who is coming from the perspective that a lot of you probably out there are coming from of a son or a grandson a grandchild of uh, immigrants because of the castro takeover there in cuba and so all of a sudden we kind of had the perfect storm combine that with declassification of a lot of things from the 60s and 70s and we feel as though that we can possibly write this book. And really what, what we're looking at in so many respects is Miami is unique. And I know we all know that, right? You know, in the nightlife and, 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 you know, the parties and just the weather and the hurricanes and everything else, Miami is unique. But we never really realized, or at least until I started looking into this, how unique Miami truly is and how it stands out from all the other major cities in the United States. And part of it, is because of weather. Part of it is because we are the only major city that actually has a direct line of sight to both Latin America and Europe, right? You know, we are kind of the pivot point for what we're looking at in, in as far as foreign policy for the United States. 
And of course, you know, we have now become the capital of Latin America. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. So I'm going to share my screen because I spent all of about 25 minutes yesterday putting together the greatest PowerPoint you're ever going to see in your entire life. And it really 20 of the 25 minutes were spent trying to get these colors right. Because these are not normal, unique colors that you find on a PowerPoint presentation. So the working title of the book is A City Built by Spies. And, and we, we really think that we can back this up. Whoa. Because what we're looking at in this case is a city that, yeah, the weather's great. And yes, there's a lot of snowbirds down there. And yes, people want to visit, whether it's Will Smith or anyone else. The city does not become what it is today if it wasn't for national security and specifically for the CIA. Yes, the other three-letter agencies were involved as well, but the CIA is really the key component there. And, I, and you're the one audience that I can actually talk about bringing their talent to South Beach and you get it. I've thrown that a lot of friends out here. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, it's LeBron. Like, it doesn't get it. So at least you guys will appreciate that. So let's start. And actually, when we talk about Miami, what do we really mean? What do we really mean Miami-Dade County? And for some of the older folk out there, I grew up in Dade County, not Miami-Dade County. I, that's, you know, that's what it really is to me. So if something important happened in Hialeah, I'm not going to ignore it because it's not the city of Miami. As we all know, the city of Miami is tiny, tiny. You know, if it's Coral Gables, that counts. If it's Pinecrest, that counts. If it's Palmetto Bay, Homestead, that counts. Here we're talking about Miami-Dade County. And I'm not cheating when I talk about that, right? I'm not expanding my premise because for most of us growing up down there, if anyone from the rest of the world asks us where we're from, usually you don't say homestead, you say it's Miami, right? I was from unincorporated Dade County, which is now Pinecrest. My address didn't say Pinecrest, even though people tried to make it. It was Miami till the day I moved. So that's what we're talking about here. So let, let's talk about why we're so unique. Let's take the population of some major cities in 1890. Now, why do I pick 1890? Well, the historians out there will, will understand if we're talking about foreign policy, this is an important decade for the United States. This is really the decade where the United States goes from being somewhat insular, somewhat in, internal looking. Uh, we're looking our wounds from the Civil War still. There's a lot of reconstruction problems going on. You know, you really start to look outwardly in the 1890s. And of course, by the late 1890s, we're at war with Spain. We win this war in about 10 minutes. And then we own all these far off territories. So the 1890s is a really good indicator for looking at the size of cities and their complete independence from American foreign policy. So these cities that we're talking about here grew the way that they did because of internal movements. In some cases, there was some immigration, the Irish certainly during the Irish famine, you have some others. But at this point, we're looking at internal immigration. So you look at Cook County, Chicago, right? 1.1 million. New York City, 2.6. The Boston metro area, 1.4. Philadelphia, over a million. Even LA County, when we're going way out west, right? You're talking about over 100,000. Seattle, as far away from Miami as you can get, is over 63,000. And then Honolulu is almost 90,000. So the expectation for these cities being kind of what Miami is today is that we're probably in the ballpark of these cities. And if, if you want to guess 10, 15, 20, 30,000, 100,000, 200,000, you would be wrong. In 1890, the entire population of Miami-Dade County is 861 people. Not 861,000, right? 861. So this is the time to go and, you know, time machine back and buy up all the Miami Beach real estate because there's nobody there, all right? It is a ghost town. There are people there who are dying by the hundreds, and that's why the population's staying low because Walter Reed hasn't really figured out the whole malaria thing yet, there's, you know. So this is not a great place to be. And it's not like we magically jump up all that much. By 1900, the population is less than 5,000. That's the equivalent of today's Sydney, Nebraska. And if you don't know where that is, no one else does either. Or play to Rhode Island or, or, or Wyoming. Green River, Wyoming has one stoplight you drive right through it. Or again, I can make this joke to you guys, the average pre-COVID home attendance of a Marlins game. Uh, Ha ha, yes, they're better now, except for yesterday. <laughs> Not so good yesterday. Uh, I was like, the Hawks played the Dolphins? What happened? Or the, the Falcons played the Dolphins? Um, that is not massive growth. 
right? We're, we're in 10 years, we've really only grew to less than 5,000 people. So where do we actually see the growth that gets us today, right? Well, if you look at the population today, we're the number seven pop, most populated county in the country. So we go from podunk to what it is today. And it's not just about population, it's about economy also. Billions and billions of dollars flow through Miami every single day. How do we get there? Well, there are growth periods, and I think the growth periods of what we're gonna argue are intricately tied to American foreign policy, intricately tied in many cases to American intelligence policy. So if you look at 1910, we make a, we get to a whopping basically 12,000. Now, Dr. Atwood can tell you World War II had a lot to do with Miami's growth. By 1950, we're at almost 500,000. And the growth comes from a lot of things that happened during the World Wars. During World War I, a lot of American pilots were trained down in Miami. Uh, Chapman Field, where I played baseball growing up as a kid, was a World War I training, training center for pilots. You also have the Naval Consulting Board and Thomas Edison, who set up shop partially in Miami and partially in Key West and brought all the kind of the top inventors to the, to the country. In the 20s and 30s, you have the rum runners during Prohibition, people bringing in booze from the Caribbean. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard became a huge uh, influence in Miami during this time to try to track down these people trying to bring in booze to the United States. This is where people like Al Capone and the mob starts moving into South Florida. In many cases, that tended to be more West Palm Beach area, but there were some in Miami. Uh, if you saw a picture of my grandfather during his wedding, you'd chuckle and be like, what is he trying to be in The Godfather? He's not trying to be in The Godfather. He was in that business, working at places like Gulfstream and others doing running numbers. That just the way life was during this time. And then during World War II, the Latin American section of the military intelligence division was in Miami. A bunch of the U-boat chasers, both at sea and air. The PT guys were trained. John F. Kennedy was trained down in Miami on Miami Beach. So was uh, Guillermo Driggs, uh, who Dr. Ratwood looked at. Uh, people like L. Ron Hubbard, the head founder of uh, Scientology, was trained as a PT boat guy down in Miami. Lots of flight training, uh, lots of airlift moves through uh, to South America and to Europe through Miami. And the numbers were extraordinary. One quarter of all Army Air Force pilots and one fifth of all enlisted in the entire United States military went through training on Miami Beach, right? Now, they all went and fought in the war. So what caused this growth? Well, most of them said, oh my God, this is paradise. So I'm gonna come back here and live. And a lot of them did. So tens of thousands of them did. They all studied at the University of Miami under the GI Bill. And that's one of these big major growths. But we're still at less than 500,000 people. This is not a major, major city. Remember back in 1890, New York was already at 2.6 million. So we're not rivaling them yet. Where do we get this from? Well. It's the next growth period that is really the big jump from 1950 to 1970. We go from less than 500,000 to 1.26 million. That's not, a, that's not a long time, that's 20 years. And we essentially triple the population in Miami. And of course, a lot of this has to do with Fidel Castro's rise in Cuba. A lot of this has to do with the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis. A lot of it has to do with the building that Dr. Atwood is sitting in right now. I, I don't know if I can emphasize this enough when life goes back to normal, go visit the Miami Military Museum. I'm not on their payroll. I'm not on their board. The fact that they are in the JM Wave headquarters, I want to go in there with a sledgehammer and go in their walls. I know they're not going to be happy with that, but I want to see what's there. Because JM Wave, and this is one of the key components of what will be the book, key components of this argument, at one point became the second largest CIA base in the world. Only Langley, Virginia, where CIA headquarters is, had more CIA personnel than the Miami field station. And all of this was because of a man named Ted Shackley. Ted Shackley was the chief of JM Wave during its huge growth period. He is a legendary CIA officer, partially because of what he does in Miami, partially because he goes on to become the chief of station in Saigon during the Vietnam War. But here we're talking about 300 to 400 on payroll CIA personnel in Miami during the 1960s plus about 15,000 Cubans on payroll. We don't have the number yet, but there are hints, and this is something that we wanna prove through the book, that the CIA was, if not the largest employer of anyone in Miami, certainly one of the top five. It's possible that of all the employers in Miami, Dayland Mall and the Falls and University of Miami and everything else, 
Burger King, I don't think their headquarters were down there yet, but they are now. FPNL, the CIA was the largest employer of everyone inside Dade County. That's an extraordinary statistic. That, that's absolutely crazy to think that's the possibility. And, 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 you know, and that's something that we might be able to prove. And, and that even bigger thing, we're not talking just about population in this case, there are arguments. And one of them is made by Paul George. If you don't know Paul, you should. He is the official historian of Miami. Uh, he and others have argued that one third of Miami's economy in the 1960s was due to the CIA, right? One third of the economy. That is absolutely insane. The fleet that Miami had of boats and other things like that was the third largest in the entire Caribbean. Only the United States Navy and the Cuban Navy had larger navies than the CIA's Navy during this time period. And you can think about it to the fact that why, why so much? Why are they involved in such a large employer? Why one third of the economy? Well, all these people needed to buy houses. They needed to buy cars. They needed to buy furniture. They needed to buy clothes. They needed to do all the things that you need to do to live somewhere. And all that was on the payroll of the U.S. government. They actually had three or four people, and we don't know the exact CIA, so we're still trying to hunt that down. Three or four people at any one time at the Miami station just in charge of real estate, of buying real estate for safe houses, for training centers, for places for people to live when they brought people in. All right, that's how large and how significant this was. And as Dr. Atwood mentioned, uh, it didn't have on the side, side on the outside of the building, CIA. Uh, it had lots of different names. Zenith Technical Enterprises uh, was the name that went on for the longest time. Uh, once there was a national newspaper, a national magazine that wrote a story about it. Uh, it claimed that it was part of University of Miami. The president of the University of Miami said, I don't know what this is. No one believed him because everyone in Miami knew that this was a CIA station, arguably except for the people working at it. They didn't know that everybody knew it was actually a CIA station. They were kind of in a bubble when it came to that. Um, once they were outed, they didn't leave. They actually just changed the name. Uh, it went through a series of names. It was the Melmore Corporation for a while. It was the Double Check Corporation, the Gibraltar Steamship Corporation, the Vanguard Service Corporation. Names kept flipping around. Uh, one of the cool things that we want to do for this book is to get our, our hands on some of the real estate records and some of the uh, records of Miami as a city in Miami-Dade County to look for these companies buying stuff up because no one's really taking a deep dive into finding out exactly what these front companies, it's all the same one, it's all the CIA, were actually buying while they were there. And then very quickly, you have two other things that really push this time period forward. And soldiers of misfortune, uh, I, I'm kind of making fun. I shouldn't because these are very brave, uh, many of them now American citizens, very brave former Cubans, Cuban exiles, uh, who were sent all over the world, uh, in many cases finding their way inextricably in the Belgian Congo, uh, fighting against uh, uh, mis you know, uh, a communist insurgency there, the Simbas versus the Makasi. Uh, the Akasi were the Cuban uh, expatriates. Uh, you also have some moving down into Central America and the South America. Very famously, Felix uh, Rodriguez, who was uh, at one point the president of the 2506 Foundation, uh, and he got sent down by CIA to go catch Che Guevara, and did. Uh, and the last known picture of Che alive is standing next to Felix. Um, extraordinary stories from these people. Uh, and then you have people who were pulled in to the CIA, but were too crazy for the agency. If you can think about this, the roaring 60s, right, where we're running around overthrowing governments and taking people out and assassinating people, there were those that the CIA said, no, no, not so, you know, you, you're a little too wacky for us. And these are the organizations that are somewhat on the fringe element, the Alpha 66s and the Omega 7s of the world that actually are considered terrorist organizations by the FBI. Um, and, and those are people who found their way, their headquarters in Miami or in the Everglades, where they were running around shooting off guns and anti-tank rockets against mangrove trees and blowing up alligators. Um, some would argue playing soldier, others would argue preparing themselves to re-enter Cuba when it became time. So this is a time when, and, and this is certainly will be a big part of what we argue, when there is massive, not only population growth, but massive economic growth. 
where Miami goes from being, again, a kind of a third tier city to a borderline major U.S. city. But it took a third period where we are going to focus on as well. And that's a time between 1970 and today. And I know that's a humongous time period, but it really starts seeing economic growth going from the tens and hundreds of millions to be billions and billions of dollars going through the city of Miami. And part of it was the growth of the, the, the FBI down in Miami. And this was in the 1970s when a program called COINTELPRO uh, started spying on American citizens and many of the people during the Vietnam anti-war protests, people who were fighting for civil rights like the Black Panthers, the New Left, were being spied on by the FBI because of the belief that there were direct ties to Cuban intelligence. You also have, of course, the Mariel Boatlift in 1980, which we thought was going to be a relatively small uh, group of people coming over, and it turned out to be extraordinarily large compared to what we expected. 99% um, of the Marielitos, or the people who came over from Mariel, are wonderful members of Miami society today. 1% or maybe even bigger, we don't necessarily know the number, uh, were Cuban spies. Uh, we have it, you know, people like Brian Littell and others have shown us that uh, Castro was very good at inserting Cuban intelligence officers into these groups of exiles that were coming over to spy on the community. And everything, you know, there's no way to know this for sure, but there are some numbers that say one out of every 10 Cuban exiles was a Cuban intelligence officer. Uh, it's not a good number if you think that's the case. It's probably much, much larger than that. But it still does not get rid of the idea that there were a lot of DGI, which is Cuban intelligence people, coming over. In the 1980s, you have the Central American push. El Salvador, Nicaragua, the Contras, where you're looking at the American support. All of that money, all those guns, all that support went through Miami. And many of the people actually running these operations were former Cuban exiles, like Felix Rodriguez, who was working not for CIA, but as a contractor in El Salvador. Um, and then, of course, a uh, very kind of tongue-in-cheek coke and dagger. This is the, the cocaine cowboys time of the 1980s, the Miami Vice, the neon, the you know, scarface of the 1980s. Well, what does this have to do with intelligence? Well, there is a longstanding conspiracy theory that we are going to ignore that the CIA was complicit in moving cocaine and crack cocaine into Miami City, Miami and other cities. That is nonsense. But what isn't nonsense was the United States government and particularly the CIA looking the other way, knowing exactly what the cartels were doing, knowing how they were making their money and not doing anything about it, primarily because the cartels hated communism as much as we did. And in many cases, the cartels were directly fighting against some of these leftist or communist governments that we didn't like very much. And so the CIA did look the other way. And then of course, later on, you have Southcom re, uh, relocating from Panama to the United States, which brings in a lot of DIA personnel and a lot of Coast Guard intelligence. And today, as uh, my co-author says very often, today we are the most Isley Cantina of the world. If you're a Star Wars fan, you know what I'm referring to here. Anything you want done, you can find someone in Miami to do it for you. If you want to overthrow a government somewhere, there's some commando or former spook in Miami that'll get it done. If you want to go and run some counterinsurgency somewhere, you can find someone. It's, it is ground zero for riffraff, former spies, current spies, not only from Cuba and from Latin America, but now, as FIU knows, sadly, from places like China, from places like Russia, where some, uh, you know, the, 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 st the ridiculous story about sending in a, a force to overthrow the leadership of Venezuela, I, we all read that up in Washington, and I was laughing, saying, there's no way this doesn't tie directly to Miami. There's absolutely no way. There's, and of course, the mercenaries met on Brickle uh, in a hotel room, right? It, it's, it's guaranteed, right? It's like there's the whole Florida man mystique. There's the Miami mystique. And when it comes to you want to do a really stupid idea somewhere, go tackle, overthrow a government, you, you do it here, right? You find your guy in Miami. And so we look at these time periods and we say, okay, there's no way you get a city the way we have today without intelligence, without national security, and without this influx of not only people, but also money that turns Miami into what it is today. And so that's, that is the broad overview.
there's so much more to that. I mean, there's massive amounts that we could talk about here, whether it's looking at the Cuban Five, the WASP network, Ana Montes, looking at what, what Dr. Atwood mentioned, the Nike missile sites that are still out in the Everglades. You can take tours and look at them. Looking at things like Paul Tibbetts grew up a couple blocks, so the, the guy who bombed Hiroshima grew up a couple blocks away uh, and actually went to Miami High right before my dad did, right? So th there's a lot of wonderful history here that we're going to kind of take a real big bite out of uh, and try to, and I say this kind of, I'm not humble, but I say this as humbly as I possibly can, to try to create the kind of the definitive history of how Miami became Miami. And in our argument, and, you know, we're certainly standing on the shoulders of others, um, in our argument, we're saying it came Miami because in many respects, because of the U.S.-Cuban rivalry, because of American foreign policy that was so focused on Cuba and Latin America, and people, money, spooks, craziness, all flooded into creating our magic city today. So I want to stop there because I want to make sure that there's time for questions. Um, looks like there's about a half an hour, which is great. Uh, Brian, I'm going to kick it back to you. I'm going to kick out of my screen and let you have it back. Um, stop, share. All right, back in business. Vince, that was excellent. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with me and giving us a little bit of, you know, a little bit of insight into what's forthcoming. Um, I'll tell you, I didn't. There's some of that history that I, I just wasn't aware of. Um, and I think you you said it. Um, you said it. Miami today um, is perhaps what it was in that period, and maybe exponential in an order of one in terms of you know, the, the, the center of gravity for intelligence in South Florida, and you, you said it, the Chinese, the, the, you know, the Cubans are still here, there's no doubt about that, but the Chinese, the Iranians, the Russians, etc. cetera, uh, Miami is, is increasingly, you know, a center of gravity just because of the nature of, of you know, the melting pot that we are, um, and where we sit in the intersection of American national interests in the world, right? And that's, and that's one of the things that, that I found really interesting is if you, most of us who studied diplomatic history or anyone who studied, you know, American foreign policy during the Cold War, you think of the major cities that are during the Cold War, Washington and Moscow, of course, but the Berlins of the world, the Viennas of the world, the Beijings, you know, Miami has to be in that conversation. Yeah. Because if you're looking to Europe, sure, you're looking at Berlin, Vienna, Moscow. If you're looking to Asia, you're looking at Beijing and Hanoi. If you look south, right? Miami is ground zero. Miami is the Berlin of the Cold War in Latin America, right? It, you, cannot, you can't say it's anywhere else, right? It is the epicenter of this. And, and very few people, there are some, but very few people have looked at this. And no one, I believe, we believe, has done the big picture. And it's because it's been insanely hard to do. And I think that we're now at this kind of happy moment where things are being declassified enough that we can take a big chunk out of this. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And, and as you mentioned earlier, it was always in your face. It wasn't so much a secret. Right? It was the best kept non-secret right. out there. And I think that still very much exists today. Uh, I can't tell you how many events I've gone to, you know, where people are pointing each other out for working for a foreign government. And, uh, you know, it's just, I, I was there, I you was know, giving a talk on Venezuela and that's exactly what happened. It erupted because you know, um, you know, Venezuelan diaspora were pointing out people that were affiliated with the Venezuelan government. And, and so again, this is, this remains, I think, a center of gravity in, you know, in that discussion. Um, one question before I, I, you know, invite, um, you know, our audience to participate in the discussion. One question I have is, and, and, and I, I think you embraced it, but I, I'd like to tease it out a little bit more. Uh, how do you disaggregate the massive amounts of migration into Miami during those time periods from, you know, the role that perhaps, um, you know, the intelligence community at large played in sort of bolstering the population. I think those time periods were very much consistent when you had massive, not just from Cuba, by the way, okay. right? You had dictatorships across Latin America that were inspiring, you know, people to flee. Uh, and Miami was a major destination for many of those, uh, those communities. Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Actually, I think the, the population growth because of that is part of the story. You know, it, it's, it's the, the American-Cuban rivalry. If you, people would have come over, certainly, uh, when Castro took power. Uh, but because of the Miami-Cuban rivalry, because Castro has turned toward the Soviet Union, which happens as a result of a lot of things. But, you know, obviously, my, the United States stiffens up, pushes him in the direction of the Soviets. 
And that really pushes forward the second and third and fourth and fifth waves of immigration. But I would talk about the kind of the fidelism, right? You talk about Marxist-Leninism, right? So Marx created Marxism, Lenin tweaked it to Marxist-Leninism. Well, Castro had his own ism. Uh, we haven't really figured out what we're going to call it yet. Fidelism kind of works a little bit better. But that fidelism spread throughout Latin America, right? So most Latin American leftist movements were not looking to Moscow or Beijing or looking, reading, reading 19th century German philosophy. They were looking to Fidel. Right? They were looking like, can we replicate what happened in Cuba? And the U.S. government wasn't looking at them as being influenced by perhaps some kind of natural inside the country populist movement. It's like it's got Castro's fingerprints all over it, right? If you sure. look at American policy. So, so I don't consider them different, right? The, the people who are fleeing from these areas are caught up in this broad U.S.-Cuban rivalry, whether it's Cuba or not. They're caught up in kind of policy that's being dictated from 1959 on. And so, I, I, again, I don't see them as being different. I don't see them as being mutually exclusive. I mean, even Mariel, right? Mariel was Castro's big screw you to the United States. Yeah. You have some wonderful people that came over, but he opens the prisons and opens the state asylum and just says, you deal with them. And that is not by mistake. It's not like he wants to free all these people because he all of a sudden has a come to Jesus moment. It's to kind of say, screw the Americans. And so you're in a position where the immigration is part of the story. It's not separate from. I think that's a great point. And, and as you, as you, as you indicate, you know, there's the formal intelligence, but then there are those that are being co-opted by the foreign, you know, formal intelligence. Uh, and so you have all of these <clears throat> very intricate webs of just average day citizens that are being co-opted by, you know, one government or the other to feed information into their respective machines that sort of cultivate intel. And, and one of the great ways to, to kind of couch this is to look at the, the WASP network, the Cuban Five. Yeah, yeah. The Cuban Five did not come to the United States to spy on the Americans, right? The United States government. They came yeah. to the United States to study, to spy on the exile community, yeah, that's right? right. They, were, they were spying on Brothers of the Rescue. They were spying on what was happening in Miami and Tampa and other places. So the immigrants, you know, those that came, regardless of where they came from, were not their own little magic fiefdom that we don't pay attention to. They're part of the espionage story, That's right. right? Tens of thousands of them were used and someone sent back into Cuba, were used to, to get, gather information, in many cases used to create propaganda. You got TV Marti and Radio Marti and all this stuff that the U.S. government was doing. And in many cases, they're, they're, there's part of this story that will involve politics also, right? We can't ignore the transformative impact of this on politics. And so even there, they have part of this foreign policy decision-making because they guide American politics so much. Florida in the last couple of elections and the, you know, the tri-counties in the last couple of elections, you can't ignore that if you're gonna talk about US foreign policy. That's an excellent point. So I see Dr. Uh, Dr. Colonel Crowther has, uh, has his hand up. You want to interject? So uh, Vince, great job. Uh, back to the immigration thing. The interesting thing about being here is you can tell when a neighborhood was built based on who lives there. You know, the, uh, the Nicaraguans are over there, therefore it was built in 1979 and stuff like that. You know, yeah. Hialeah was the western boundary of Miami during the early 60s. And so you can track all the different demographies of who's where uh, and uh, and it is the history of Miami it's the yeah. history of the building of Miami from the late 1950s through today uh, you know there's uh, to everybody else there's you know uh, I'm, I'm in New Hampshire right now and uh, overheard some people talking about Cubans yesterday Cuban voters right and to them they're a uh, they're a ah, a, a unified block uh, when in actuality, you know, you got the the early 1960s ones, and you got the late 1960s ones, and then you got the Marielitos, and then you got the people who only known communism and came later, and there's like six or seven demographic groups in the Cubans alone, and only uh, we who study Miami uh, are the ones who get that, but it's uh, that means it's an open field for people who study Miami, right. and a heck of a lot of fun to study. And then you're ignoring the second and third generations too, right? I mean, absolutely. You know, someone who is 35 
and the son or grandkids of people who came over in the '60s, or they're they're not going to have anywhere near the same experiences. And and if you you know FIU politics is really good at studying this, but you know they tend to be more blue, right? They're they're much yeah. more Democrat, right? You know, so you can say, well, the Cubans down in Miami are all going to vote Republican. Well, it depends on how old they are, when they came right. over, what yeah. their experiences are, and everything else. And I think that is also a fascinating part of this conversation, also because you see these communities who all had very different intelligence experiences and very different foreign policy experiences based on when they came over also. And so, although I'm a diplomatic historian, um, I, I, I have a lot of friends who are cultural and social historians. I'm going to lean very heavily on them. There's, there's going to have to be a chunk of this book. There's going to have to be a chapter that focuses on how culture and, and societal influences impacted foreign policy and intelligence and that's just not my field but i'm gonna have to make it some because if you ignore it you're you're missing a huge huge part of the story absolutely right dr atwood you, you want to jump in go for it you're on mute dude you're on mute <laughs> Maybe Time magazine's word of 2020 okay. yes part part of the story is is the military geography of the locale and you go well what do you mean by that the fact is you've got a narrow coastal strip of habitable land running from Palm Beach to Key West. And if you go inland more than a few miles, you run into the Everglades. So people could not branch off into uh, other cities around the peninsula in this lower portion of it. They're just kind of jammed together. And and that was a good point, Alex, about uh, the uh, the various cities. Uh, Doral, Doral is uh, little Venezuela. Uh, anyhow, the geography is is a big part of it. Thanks, Doctor Atwood. Okay, we got we still have a few minutes. Um, any any other thoughts? Uh, let me know by raising your hand or signaling me or throwing something at the screen some way to. Let me know you want to jump in. Keegan, I see you got your hand up. Go for it. Unmute and, uh, and go for it. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, everything. I really enjoyed the lecture or the, the talk. Um, and I actually wanted to uh, mention that I'm a big podcast fan. I drive, I'm from Tennessee, so I always drive back and forth to Miami. Um, and I always download a lot of podcasts. So I'm familiar with I have two favorite podcasts. <laughs> One of them is I Spy um, from Foreign Policy, and the second being Spycast. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to say uh, two. I really enjoyed the episodes. I wrote them down about the, I, I think his name was Kevin King, who was with the Taliban for three years or held hostage. And the second one I particularly enjoyed was Operation Lemonade mm -hmm. um, about the double agent with the US Navy. Um, I'm really interested in like uh, naval intelligence and stuff like that. So that really excited me. But in regards to South Florida and Cuba in the Cold War, when I watched or when I listened to I Spy, there I remember a an episode about I don't know I can't remember his name unfortunately, but he was a Cuban double agent and um, I think that he had he in, I think it was in Vienna if I remember correctly, and he had said, oh, um, a lot of the agents that the CIA, CIA had recruited in Cuba were actually double agents, um, and that, that was one of, the, one of the many things that made Fidel Castro uh, a very strategic and powerful, yeah. um, I guess, intelligent yeah. you know, director in, in that regards. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that was really interesting that like almost everyone or or a big majority of the double agents of the CIA had recruited were, were not, a, not, not a majority, everyone. From 1964 <laughs> to the mid-1980s, every single person we thought we had recruited inside Cuba had been flipped back against us. We were O for 20 years. It was extraordinarily bad. Um, and, and it wasn't until we actually had someone defect and let us know that this was happening that we discovered it. So talk about, you know, pound for pound, the Cuban intelligence agency has to be one of the best in the world. Um, now, they only have one target in the United States, so it makes life a lot easier for them. But they are exceptionally good at what they do. Now, you mentioned SpyCast. There's a, there's a great three-part, because I spent so much time with them, 
three-part spy cast when I sat down with Felix Rodriguez, who was not only a, a great team member, a gray, G-R-A-Y team member uh, for, during the Bay of Pigs, which meant he infiltrated before the landings. Uh, he also was about to be parachuted in for the, for the actual Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, if it was going to happen, he was going to like essentially laze missile sites for the Air Force. And he's the guy who caught Che down in Bolivia. I sat in his living room, his up-armored, reinforced glass living room, because the Cuban government's still trying to kill him, for about four hours. And just recorded, just had a conversation back and forth, and we had to break it up into three parts. So go, it's like from years ago, the Felix Rodriguez one is amazing. Uh, it's PG-13. He can't say a, a sentence without using a bad word in it, but it's so damn entertaining. It's ridiculous. Getting a chance to sit down with someone like that who – had to lie, you know, he was 17 when Bay of Pigs happened. He had to basically, you know, forge his dad's signature to sign up for it. This is somebody who was going to see Cuba returned to the people pre-Castro and, um, you know, still hasn't happened, but he's still alive and kicking. So maybe one day, but uh, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm now, I can say this, uh, I'm, I'm technically the historian and curator emeritus of the International Spy Museum. Uh, my last day was last week. Um, I'm moving on to other things that hasn't been made fully public yet, but when it is, you'll hear about it. Um, my replacement is awesome. Uh, he'll keep SpyCast going and rocking. So, and he'll certainly keep working with FIU. So will I. Again, when you hear where I'm going, you'll you'll see that there'll still be a great relationship happening uh, between FIU uh, and me in the future. But thank, thanks for your question. And we're excited about that, Vince. It's been a while coming, and now yeah. it's, uh, it's happening. So we're excited yeah. for the – we'll keep the secret going, though, for now. Uh, it is Intel. It, it, this is the Intel business, anyway. So, all right, I got a few hands up. Let's go to Joshua Bergen. Where are you at, Joshua? Just go ahead and un unmute and, uh, and ask your question. Hey, thank, thank you very much. It's been a really, uh, really informative and, and interesting and, and entertaining, in fact, um, you know, uh, series. I, I just want to ask, so we, we've been talking uh, mostly about the Cold War history of Miami and the development of Miami, but I'm curious to know what uh, people think about the present and future of Miami. So I just a bit of background, like I've been, I've either lived or been stationed in um, Peru and Argentina, and I completely agree with the assessment of Miami as the capital, in some sense, of of Latin America, it's it's absolutely true, like undeniable. People go there to rub shoulders, to shop, to send their kids to school. Um, what 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 do you guys think of what um, you know? What what are the coming decades going to look at look at uh, or look like for Miami? uh with respect to south america buy your, buy your scuba gear um if miami exists in the coming decades it'll be surprising um <laughs> I, I well what i think is interesting about your question is you're, you're exactly right i mean i think that there has been uh a shift away from a focus on cuba specifically i'm talking about big picture u.s foreign policy uh Cuba, you know, is always going to be there because it's always going to be important to South Florida and Florida is always going to be important to Washington because of politics and everything else. But when you're looking at foreign policy, uh, there are other places that matter a lot. And certainly they're going to matter more to us in the future when we start thinking about what the Chinese are going to think about doing uh, in Western South America, because that, you know, what actually abuts against the Pacific Ocean, uh, what the Russians are thinking about doing when it comes to Venezuela and other places. Uh, you know, it, it's one of these things where uh, for a long time we were able to kind of ignore it. And I mean, again, in Washington, we we're able to kind of ignore Latin America, much in the same way we ignored Africa. And that has kind of come back to bite us in the ass because both of these continents, we don't have the kind of presence that we should. Uh, I mean, we did in Central America when Southcom was there and when we had the Panama Canal, but when we pull Southcom back to Miami, we are far away. I don't care how close Miami is as the kind of the capital of Latin America. We're not all that close to places that matter in, especially in South America. Uh, and so there needs to be an understanding of this by Washington. I don't think there is. Uh, Latin American experts have been somewhat pushed to the side. 
uh, because the big foreign policy questions are counterterrorism still, uh, China, North Korea, Iran, Russia. Venezuela comes up when politics come into play, right? When Marco Rubio decides to make Venezuela an issue. Uh, I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but it's not something on the lips of all the National Security Council advisors to President Trump, and it wasn't to President Obama, and it's not going to be to President whoever's next. It, it's just something that 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 is has been ignored, and and whether that's good or bad uh, remains to be seen. I would argue it's a little bit of both. And why would I say it's it's good? It's because we only have so much bandwidth, and I think that's something that you know Brian can certainly talk about. The intel community is huge, but it really can only look at so much at such a time. Uh, Policymakers, and by this I mean members of Congress, uh, don't know anything about anything, let's be honest. Um, we just lost uh, one of the most knowledgeable members of Congress from Miami, Eliana ross Leighton, who has a great FIU connection. She had been there so long, she knew everything there was to know about Latin America, uh, but now she's moved on. And, you know, as Donna Shalala's Miami connections are great, but she, she doesn't know. And it's not her fault. You know, out of the 535 members of Congress that matter, 520 of them probably couldn't find Chile on a map. Except, well, maybe it's a really long one at the bottom, right? It's just not something these guys are trained to do. And there's only so much bandwidth that the people who matter have. And their bandwidth right now is focused on re-election. Their bandwidth is focused on raising money. And if they're thinking foreign policy, thinking about Iran, they're thinking about North Korea, they're thinking about Russia, they're thinking about China, maybe they're thinking about NATO, they're not thinking about Ecuador or Uruguay or what's happening in Bolivia today, right? That's just not enough. They just don't have enough juice to do all of that. And then there's the poor bastards at CIA, right? The head of the Latin American division screaming to be taken seriously and most of the time not listened to because the director of the CIA has to care about North Korea and Iran and China and Russia and all these other things. He's not necessarily comp thinking about the new, econ you know, the, the dire economic situation in Montevideo. Again, not a perfect situation, but it's really what we're dealing with right now. I think it's, I think it's more than fair, Vince. In fact, uh, I've always learned that some of the most influential political appointees, those that really get a chance to make policy, are those that come from Latin America and regions that don't get the attention. Yeah. And the reality is because they don't get the face time and the, they're not in the Oval Office briefing routinely uh, and being hijacked in terms of the structure of policy. They're often given a lot of latitude to build policy because it frankly isn't a priority and it doesn't need to rise or manifest to the level of the Oval Office. I mean, there's a reality to that. And I, I, I can't say how many NSC directors I've talked to that have said, hey, I have tremendous latitude to shape policy. Um, you know, as long as it isn't damaging to, you know, sort of political campaigns or aspirations, but, um, but, but it's a reality. It, it doesn't manifest up. Uh, the reason why um, Cuba and maybe why Venezuela and, and, and others do make their way to some degree in those discussions is because you have Cuban American, you know, lawmakers, um, you know, Marco Rubio still, Diaz Balart, uh, and before him, his brother and, and Bob Melendez. Uh, so those folks still have considerable influence and they're the ones that carry the torch. Right. Um, but, but I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and um, one of the reasons that really matters is, is, for two things. One is it matters the Cubans and the Venezuelans and their influence on their neighbors makes a difference, right. much in the same way as the influence of Russia and China on Latin America, because the American economy depends on Latin America as a consumer, right? A lot of our products are sent to Latin America, right? So that, that's one of the reasons the Marshall Plan, go back right to kind of think old school you know, American national security policy. Why do we rebuild Europe after World War II? We rebuild Europe after World War II because we want a place to sell our stuff, right? Well, that's, that's the problem. If, if Latin America goes red, to use the old phrase, if it, if it becomes anti-US in its policy standings, you're losing important markets for American goods. You're losing important markets for natural resources that become American goods. Uh, and that's something that, you know, the economy, it's the economy stupid, right? It was Bill Clinton's motto, right? That's economics have played a role in a lot of decisions that we've made, not just in Latin America, but around the world for the last 200 years. Yeah, and as, as Jerry pointed out uh, in, a, in a message earlier, the connection between Miami, closest port to Central America, 
uh, in South America. And so that, you know, sort of that intersection just makes us, as you said, you know, incredibly vital. Um, we have time for, I got three more hands up. So I'm going to take these last three, um, all three incredibly talented students. Brian Suarez, uh, you're up first. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank you for this uh, lecture and talk. It's quite interesting. And I didn't know a lot of the things of, about Miami and specifically um, to relate to my question about Cuban intelligence, I didn't realize how much of a presence, how strong the Cuban intelligence was here in Miami. And to kind of bounce off that, so the Cold War is over and it ended about 30 years ago. And so with the Cold War being over, <laughs> with the Cold War being over, I was wondering how does, one, does Cuba still have a, a big presence here in the U.S. or even specifically here in Miami? And two, what are they focusing on now that the Soviet Union's gone and Cold War was kind of won by us? Well, it's even more important for Cuban intelligence, for the Cuban government to know what's going on here because they've lost their big media benefactor in the Soviet Union. And, you know, you could argue that, that Cuba's kind of place in the Cold War was almost outside of the broader Cold War policy because it's so close, because it's so intricately tied to American history. Uh, Cuba is gonna stand above all these other things. And, and I think that that's why I kind of brought up this concept of fidelism, right? It, it's not about necessarily the Cold War in America and the Soviets. It's about the idea of spreading these ideals throughout Latin America. That's still happening, right? That's still something that we, we worry about to this day and kind of what we just talked about because of economic issues, because of you know, the idea of kind of keeping the OAS very American friendly. We want to make sure this is our hemisphere, right? We're kind of thinking, going Monroe Doctrine action on our ass here, right? We're going back hundreds of years thinking about this is our neighborhood, right? You know, we're controlling this neighborhood. Ideals that are counter to American ideals should not take precedent. And that's always been kind of the push against Cuba. I mean, we were anti-Castro before he embraced the Soviets, right? You have to understand that, right? Like, when, when Castro takes power, he doesn't, I mean, there's a lot of arguments about this, but, you know, I'm allowed to kind of come at it somewhat objectively about this. When Castro takes power, he's not really a communist, right? He's a populist. He's a, he cares about Castro, right? He cares about Fidel, right? He isn't, he's not reading, you know, Mao's Little Red Book. He's not reading Marx's Lenin's. He cares about Fidel and only Fidel. His first trip is not to the Soviet Union, it's to the United States, right? He comes here and tries to get us to support and a good trade and other things like that. He goes in New York, everyone, uh, because of the Nixon and, and Eisenhower administration and vice versa, uh, he's basically banned from being in any hotel. He finally finds a place in Harlem because it's the only uh, hotel in the entire United States that allow him to come here. And then he gives, if you, if you get a chance, it's very hard to find, but if you can go on YouTube and find his speech he gives in New York, his English is better than mine. It is unbelievably good. And basically, when he got told to go to hell by the United States government, he said, I'm never speaking English again. And he never did, right? And all, all of his interviews were in Spanish, even though his English is perfection. My point being, while he was doing this, his brother Raul and Che were on a plane to Moscow because they knew better than Fidel. And Fidel was a little bit naive. The United States would never ally itself with someone coming in and trying to nationalize everything, right? It wasn't about communism. It was about nationalism. It was about the American economic interest in Cuba. So they said, the Americans are going to tell us to go to hell. So let's start working, you know, mommy against daddy and go round up the Soviets to come help us. When Fidel found out about this, he was out of his mind furious. If it wasn't his brother and Che, they might have been executed for going behind his back and doing this. But of course, they come back and say, yeah, the Soviets will do anything we want them to, right? Khrushchev is on board. You got the money you need, all this stuff. So he kind of, so kind of a fait accompli at that point. My point being, it was never about communism. It was always about Fidel and nationalism in Cuba. And until that goes away, it's never going to be something we can just sit by and allow to happen. I don't, I, I don't think, I mean, I agree that policymakers and politicians play a role in this, but it is now so intricately tied in the American ideals of foreign policy that Cuba bad, right? The Cuban government is communist. It's a mixture, just like China, just like even Vietnam right now. The, the only full-fledged wackadoodle combination on planet is North Korea. 
and they're and then they're so far commie that they're not even communist anymore. They've gone so far to the left, they've come around to the right. And and so everyone's kind of this hodgepodge melange. It really comes down to Cuba's 90 miles away from Key West. And it's always going to matter to us. No matter what's going on in the rest of the world, it's always going to make a difference. Man, that could have been answered in like two sentences, but it took me 20 minutes. But there's your answer. I like the description of North Korea. Yeah. Think about it coming all the way back around like it did. Yeah. But you're right. Uh, all right, Vivian. So we got Vivian and Caesar, and then we'll wrap up. So Vivian, you're up. Hi. Um, thank you for the great lecture. Um, when you were mentioning about how about one in 10 – of the Cuban refugees were um, spying. I thought that was um, really interesting because even though it seems like, if you paint the picture, like it seems maybe, oh, it, it would be like everybody's suspicious in Miami at that time, right? Like everybody is questioning everybody else, but really like those people were obviously very unsuspecting that was their job. But that's why I was wondering, are you going to, for this book, interview people who were around during that time because I mean, those people are, I mean, obviously they're still around, but they, there's so many stories yeah. about, you know, like knowing people in their own family who came and then left back to Cuba, um, you know, and suspected of spying or even just activity in Miami. I mean, there's so many people who have so many good anecdotes. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that if it wasn't for COVID, I'd be down there right now, right? Doing exactly that. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're crossing our fingers for a quick vaccine because there's a lot of interviewing that we need to do down in Miami. I mean, look, we're, we're putting the call out, right? If, if you're in your attic, your grandfather's stuff is in your attic and he fought for 2506, we want that stuff. If you know a neighbor who parachuted into somewhere, we want that stuff. If somebody was in the Congo, we want that stuff. If somebody worked at JM Wave, we want that stuff. If somebody went out for fun in the summertime in the Everglades and blew shit up, we want that stuff. We're trying to make this as big and broad as we possibly can. You asked, are we going to interview people? Well, I have connections inside Cuba so with the GGI. So I, my, my former job as of last week gave me the opportunity to go and talk to some people who are still over there. And I'm, my hope is that we interview the Cuban Five. My hope is that I can interview Ana Montes, who I know is still here, but she's in prison. My hope is that we can actually create a, a quasi-dialogue because there, there are – What's interesting is if you can get around some of the bureaucracy, you can get people to open up to you inside Cuba. Um, the, there, there are the, the museums that are there under the Ministry of Culture. The problem is they're also under the Ministry of Defense. But if you can get them to keep it at the level of the Ministry of Culture, all sorts of people will talk to you. If it gets to the point where the Ministry of Defense knows that you're there, then you get run out of the place, which I did. They found out I was there and they didn't like it very much. But for the couple of days they didn't know I was there, everybody talked to me. And that we think is an opportunity. I, I made enough connections that I can do email or now Zoom and everything else. So yeah, I'm hoping to talk to people who were actually deployed to Miami at one point, who actually did recruit people. Uh, another great connection I have is the former major general in the KGB, Oleg Kalugin, who actually ran operations inside the United States. Uh, he is a board member of the Spy Museum. He's He's actually ran some very famous American spies, Kim Philby, who was a British spy, uh, John Walker, who was an American, and he knew everybody at DGI, and he visited Cuba a lot, and so that will give us some insight also. So yeah, no, we're not, we're going to turn every stone we can possibly turn. We're going to talk to everyone we possibly can. Um, you know, part of it is, is again, I, I, I don't have the resources to do this linguistically, but my colleague Eric does. I'm, we're going to shove them into the domino game in Little Havana, right? And just say, like, just talk to everybody, right? And, uh, we're going to shove them into the 2506 headquarters, walk down the street on Calle Ocho and talk to everybody. That is going to be what we do. And, of course, since I grew up down there, I have 100 friends who all have parents and grandparents who, who came over. And so addicts, the addicts of Miami, we're going to raid the shit out of those things, right? We want everything there is to have. Uh, we just don't want to leave any of this to where there's an unanswered question. If it's unanswered because I can't get it because it's classified, I can live with that. If it's unanswered because I didn't try hard enough to get it, I can't live with that. That's the kind of researcher I am. And Eric, my co-author, is 100% that way too. Well, look, er Eric's already rocking the UM shirt, I think. And all he, I mean, he can <laughs> the UM shirt or he can flip on a guayabera. I mean, I've got some whatever. green going on that. <laughs> and it's gonna, it's gonna work out a-okay. All right, last but not least, Caesar, are you still on? There you are, Caesar. what do you got? 
Uh, first, I would like to thank you for giving that presentation. I grew up here in Miami, my entire lived here in my entire life, and I always thought it was like just Vice City, but now I know it's also Spy City. So um, that's something interesting to keep out with. Um, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned this briefly, but I wanted to see. I wanted to expand on it on Russian Chinese activity in Miami, specifically on the Chinese, because considering that I always was under the assumption that Chinese activity in Latin America was more direct with their diplomatic counterparts. So I was wondering, I was curious as to why they would be in Miami in the first place. Because everybody else is in Miami, right? A lot of times you're not necessarily sending in intelligence officers to spy on someone important in that city like that's actually from that city, right? So you're not, they don't, you're not sending somebody in to see, you know, maybe I can steal Manny Diaz's playbook. No, they're, they're not trying to, to get, but they're going in there because there are diplomats from every other city, every country in the world, because they're important companies that have places in Miami because, you know, it is now a multi, multi hundred billion dollar economy down there that is indicative of what's happening in the broader American economy. And because it's the wild west, right? If you want to meet an agent, it's very easy for someone, let's say working for a U.S. government agency here in Washington, D.C. to get on a plane and fly to Miami with no TSA other than do you have an open water bottle, no passport, they can go, I'm, I'm vacationing down in Miami. Well, counterintelligence is not going to freak out if you're going and vacationing down in Miami. If I, I'm vacationing in Beijing, no, you're not, dude. You work for the NSA. You're not vacationing in Beijing. You're not going to Europe, right? If you're going to Europe, then you're, you know, you're so tightly wound, you can only go certain places. But if you're going to Miami, eh, you know, you know don't catch anything, you know, don't get sunburned, you know, enjoy Miami, right? Well, that's where you can meet people, right? There's all sorts of places where no one's paying attention to you. So that's where, why you know, Vienna and Berlin were kind of the center of European spying during the Cold War. It's not because anyone cared about Austria. No one gives a shit about Austria, but Vienna was ground zero of the Cold War until 1960. It's because it was where everyone met. It's where actually you could find what you needed. You could find a soldier for hire. You could find you know, your NATO representative that you could recruit to be a spy for your side. Same basic idea with Berlin, right? By that time, Germany wasn't all that important, but it was ground zero. Think of, you know, Dr. Atwood could talk some about this, but Zurich, Switzerland, and Bern, Switzerland during World War II. It was, Switzerland wasn't even in the war, but it was where everyone could meet and you could recruit spies and you could send in agents and do all this stuff. Well, Miami has become that city where you can actually find anyone and everyone without a whole lot of suspicion. Now, the FBI has gotten good, right? That's why they're arresting all these people. That's why you're reading all these stories. But the recent stories, right? right? You're seeing a lot in the last five years of the FBI arresting a Russian spy here, an Iranian spy there. Well, before that, it was open season. Now the FBI has started to realize that they've got a problem on their hands. And so the Miami station's grown exponentially, a lot more counterintelligence people down here. You know, Miami station was always big because they were chasing the drug guys. But now they've replaced a lot of the counter-narcotics guys with counterintelligence guys because, you know, Miami becomes that city. And I think that, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not going to stop, right? I, even the FBI doing as, as good a job as they're, 